Okay, Kalimper. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you all for being here. I appreciate how busy you all are. Um, I think this is one of the key discussions we're going to have here um, all year. Uh, the Spectrum Relocation Fund, let me start with that, uh, provides funding to federal agencies to research the feasibility of modifying and, if necessary, upgrading uh, the federal systems that use Spectrum. So SRF, at least as we see it, it seems limited by only uh, reimbursing a federal agency for necessary costs to update a system of quote-unquote comparable capability. So not the higher, the next level, but comparable capability. Many federal agencies have stated that the SRF limits their ability to upgrade their systems that use Spectrum just to be able to continue fulfilling their missions. So Mr. Pearl, why don't I start with you? Uh, do you believe SRF could be reformed to better incentivize agencies to share or reallocate spectrum? Why or why not? Uh, yeah, and um, I, I think it, I would put it stronger and say that SRF must be reformed, I think, if we're going to resolve these issues. I was trying to say that myself, but I was yeah. being generous. Uh, um, so, but, um, but yeah, I think you identified one of the key issues, which is that they, agencies need to be able to uh, receive upgrades and have more advanced systems. Some of these capabilities we're talking about could be paid for with auction funds. Um, I, I think it's also necessary to give NTIA the authority to, do, to get funding in order to do studies. Right now, only the agencies can get SRF money to do studies. Uh, but um, as several senators have said, it's really important, and the NTIA engineers are really looking at this from an honest broker perspective and trying to get to the right answer. And so allowing that, them to do that would be really helpful. And then I think the last thing is that there's a technical panel under the legislation, NTIA, FCC, OMB, and they approve what the agency is going to do when they do the study, but they need more oversight of the process after that because when things go off the rails and the study isn't going to be useful, you need that ability for the other agencies and the other engineers to weigh in and get things back on track. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Um, Dr. Bayless, your testimony underscores how collaboration in the academic community and, and within government and the academic community helps in, enhance this uh, Spectrum Innovation Center you lead. Um, you see firsthand how our universities educate um, and, and you know, create that workforce pipeline uh, that we need to maintain our leadership uh, in, in all STEM fields. Uh, computer scientists uh, to enhance cybersecurity of the wireless networks, uh, radio frequency engineers to develop new technologies for sharing spectrum and getting more efficient usage. Um, as we debate, as Congress debates how to study and share and and reallocate spectrum and try to be as fair and look at the, the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Uh, how do you highlight the importance of ensuring that the U.S. grows a, a trained spectrum and cyber workforce? Thank you. Appreciate the question. Uh, workforce development is one, one of the important things we do. And I think it starts with the fact that our, our faculty, our, re, our staff researchers, our students that are on this project are all U.S. citizens. You won't find that in many academic centers, but we're a bunch of patriots because we want to see this country succeed and we want to see this country be the best in wireless technology, so it starts there. I think we have to develop an American pipeline of students that is going to be able to work on the future spectrum paradigm. So we've been doing a lot of efforts, uh, one in which the National Science Foundation is currently funding, where we actually have undergraduate students from around the country apply to and get the opportunity to come to a four-day residential workshop on one of our campuses, and we'll be holding four of them this summer. Actually, one in your state at Colorado State University is one of our uh, universities, and we'll be holding one there. So you're welcome to come and check it out I if you'd like. I'll do that. We also are um, involved with the Army Research Laboratory, who we've been committed through. We have a uh, ARL fellows, I'm sorry, a Smart Hub Fellows program where we actually place students at the lab working with some of our brightest minds in the laboratory and working with each other so that they can uh, build cross-disciplinary expertise in spectrum. And we're expanding that to some other agencies now also. So we're definitely, that is a big part of bringing in the new adaptive and reconfigurable paradigm. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I'm kind of out of time. Uh, uh, Mr. Clark, I just and I'll leave this, you can uh, answer very, very concisely, this partnership between the federal government and, uh, and the auctions around how Spectrum gets divvied up. Um, 
how do you look when you're evaluating spectrum used for a federal mission? How important is it for the agencies to have a meaningful and collaborative role in that feasibility study? Right. It was really important because the, the physics matter. I think that fundamentally, no matter how much spectrum sharing or, or you know, division of the, the spectrum into more efficient bands comes, you still have to deal with the physics of certain bands are going to be useful for certain operations, and you can't just move to another part of the spectrum. So physics matter, and I think that's fundamentally where it comes down right. to. Thank you so much. I yield back to the chair. Thank you. Senator Curtis. 